Pastor Cooper yesterday laid out the basic idea of what an order salutis is and the basic attitudes since the, uh, since the 17th century when it was first used uh, until now about the whole concept, the whole idea of doing an order salutis. Um, this is our first look at the actual what it is and um, an in-depth look at how it works with the first two items on it. Now, you can set up an order salutis with different things in it, but these are the, uh, these are the things from Schmidt, Heinrich Schmidt's doctrinal theology. Um, he, was, he showed up in one of the 19th century confessional uh, renewal guys uh, in the presentation last night. And uh, this is basically his um, formulation of the important points in the Ordo Salutis. And uh, the first two are election and conversion because it's an Ordo. Uh, the whole point of an Ordo is to say what comes before what. Not always temporally, as Pastor Cooper said last night, logically is the main thing, like what logically precedes what, even if temporally they happen together. But in our experience, things that proceed logically usually proceed temporally too, right? You, you can't say, uh, you can't say um, I, I, just, I just experienced pain because you're going to hit me in a minute from now. It doesn't work that way. Causation, in our experience, is always temporal. So sometimes we have to remind ourselves that we're not talking about temporal causation in the order salutis. But, uh, Oftentimes, at least with the important points, we actually are talking about temporal causation also, or temporal precedence also. So um, we're going to have presentations on most of these. We're not going to have a separate one on perseverance, but that's just in there because uh, it's sort of the uh, conclusion of sanctification. And there are other things you could put in here, depending who's making the ordo. But. OK. Quotation here from the uh, solid declaration of the formula of Concord. Faith, first, faith is kindled in us by conversion or in conversion by the Holy Ghost through the hearing of the gospel. This faith lays hold of God's grace in Christ by which the person is justified. Then when the person is justified, he is also renewed and sanctified. So that is the ordo that you have in the formula of Concord. It's a simple ordo. Uh, they don't mention the other things because the other things aren't in dispute at that point. Although we do have a separate, we do have a separate article that talks a lot about um, mystical union in the, in the formula of Concord, but that also talks about sanctification. These are the main things. Um, you're converted, and then once you're converted through that, you are justified and renewed. Um, the, the renewed is um, connected always to sanctification. And, uh, and they don't talk about this because nobody's really disputing about that. So uh, we do have a little bit of an ordo salutis in the formula of Concord. Now we're talking first about conversion here because traditionally when the ordo salutis was handled, uh, they actually didn't handle election as part of, the, of, of that subject. Uh, the ordo salutis was handled in a section, as we learned last night, on the Holy Spirit, the work of the Holy Spirit applying uh, the work of Christ to the life of the believer in order to save him. And so uh, in the traditional formula for the uh, Lutheran dogmatics books, uh, election was handled earlier when you're talking about God. When you're talking about the causes that were in God alone, that, that was where election would be handled. And so when we get to the, the work of the Holy Spirit in us, so this is traditionally, if you're going to talk the traditional Lutheran order salutis, the most traditional version of it, conversion is actually the first the first stop on the train. But conversion is broken down smaller. And this is the thing when you start doing an ordo salutis, uh, you, you find that it starts fragmenting and getting more complicated. Um, conversion turns out to be kind of an umbrella term. And so uh, the dogmaticians recognize that under the umbrella of conversion, you have calling and illumination and then conversion proper, which most of them identified with regeneration, although some of them separated, separated those two things a little bit. And it gets finer. The distinctions become finer. Uh, we get this upside down tree effect. Uh, the dogmaticians in the age of orthodoxy, the, the traditional um, high tide of Lutheran scholasticism in Germany in the, in the 1600s, um, 
divided calling into indirect calling and direct calling, and illumination into pedagogic and spiritual illumination, and conversion and regeneration into contrition and faith. So let's deal with each of these in turn. The calling, indirect calling is basically natural revelation. They're trying to be very thorough here. They recognize that even before the Holy Spirit starts doing anything um, supernatural, uh, simply because human beings are living in a world that is created by God and has his fingerprints all over it and they are rational, uh, then they're going to simply by nature be able to conceive some kind of a desire for God, some kind of a desire for the things that God offers, um, possibly for forgiveness if they're, feeling, um, if they're feeling their sin and unworthiness, certainly for some sort of peaceful fellowship with God, peace with God and life with God. Uh, so they consider that part of the call in a very broad sense, like not, not, through the, not through the gospel or the means of grace, not specifically through the work of Christ, but very broadly speaking, that is, you know, it's, it's part of what God programmed into the universe. Uh, St. Augustine said, our, you have made us for yourself and our hearts are restless until they find their rest in you. So that's the kind of thing we're talking about there. Then the direct calling, this is the supernatural through the Holy Spirit. When you hear the word of God, it's meant to be universal, but it's actually particular due to rejection. So we have a quotation from Johann Gerhard here, who's right at the beginning of this period of uh, Lutheranism, uh, of Lutheran orthodoxy, scholasticism, post the Formula of Concord. You can see he's, he's born two years after the Formula of Concord. The call is universal as to God who issues it, but it becomes special through the fault of man. First, inasmuch as some reject it with Epicurean contempt, some also persecuting and violently repelling it. Then, inasmuch as by the fault of ancestors, the lost word is not always, in fact, preached in all nations and places. So this is a very interesting point here. Um, this word special, you know, we, we, uh, bah, we normally think of the word special as being a good thing. Um, but special in this case just means as opposed to general. It means uh, particular, specific. And um, it would seem... This argument says it would seem that, you know, Europe was particularly loved of God <laughs> that, because that's where Christendom was and that, uh, and that God didn't have as much of a heart for China for some reason because there was a little church in, in China throughout the years, but it was, it was very little. And it's not until modern times that you really see Christianity taking off in large swaths of the world. The argument here is that um, according to the general will of God to save, it comes to all men, um, their voice has gone out, into all the world, um, but uh, if it gets rejected, you know, if the, if the missionaries come to China and they are mostly rejected, and only a few people, you know, catch on and keep the tradition alive, well, down through the generations, you're not going to have people being raised as Christians, and you're not going to have, you know, basically, this is a sins of the fathers kind of thing. Um, where you have uh, an entire tradition, evil tradition arising in certain parts of, of the world in, in cultures where uh, the gospel for many people at many times isn't even a personal option to them because they're never going to meet a Christian. Um, but if things had happened differently with their ancestors' reception of the gospel, then it would be different. So when we're talking about a calling here, this has nothing to do with the Calvinist distinction between the general call and the special call. The Calvinist distinction between the general call and the special call, the general call is when you preach the word of God and you say, believe the gospel. That's a general call. Anybody can hear it. Anybody can understand the grammar of your words. And um, you know, you've just made an appeal to them. You've called them. And so there's this general call that goes out into all the world. But then they also say there's a special call. And this is when the Holy Spirit enlivens the words of the speaker, um, specifically targeted to the heart of those elect for whom Christ has died. And then it has an actual effect, and they are irresistibly drawn to that call and saved. So uh, this is uh, Johannes Andreas Quenstedt, which is a great name. Uh, he was one of the uh, later, um, he died near the end of the 17th century. We admit the distinction but not so as to oppose the external to the internal call, nor to separate one from the other. As the external call is the medium and instrument of the internal, 
and by this God works efficaciously in the hearts of men. If the external did not exactly correspond to the internal call, if a person might be externally called and not internally, it would be vain, fallacious, and illusory. So he's saying, okay, you can distinguish between what God, you know, what the pastor does with his voice and what the Holy Spirit does with the pastor's voice. You can make that distinction notionally, but you can't say that somebody was externally called without having also been internally called. Um, when, when, when the word of God goes forth, it goes forth as the word of God, and it has the power of God unto salvation. Um, a little while ago, I was reading uh, some of Pieper's treatment of inspiration, and it struck me as he's talking about inspiration how much he leans on the idea um, that it, it, the inspiration of Scripture, it's not, just, it's not just a dogma that tells us that everything we read in Scripture is true. It tells us that every time we read Scripture and every time we hear the word proclaimed, God is actually talking to us. It's not just a warrant that it's true. It's saying that what makes it the word of God is that it's spoken with God's breath, and the Spirit is God's breath. So, you know, right now, the, these words are coming out on my breath, um, but if I'm, if I'm talking the word of God, then it's also God's breath. And the Spirit, I mean, if you, if you hear that, then the Spirit is working on you. The Spirit is calling you. Um, like, Jesus, like Jesus said when he told his disciples he was going to send the Holy Spirit to convict the world of sin and of righteousness and of something else. Forgetting that. Forgetting the whole quotation there. But the Holy Spirit has a work that he does um, through that general call on everybody. There's no such thing as a call um, that's just general, that's just natural. There's always something supernatural going on. And if somebody rejects the words of the preacher, they have not rejected you, they have rejected me. And so uh, he says, you know, if, if you separate these two like the Calvinists do, then you have a fallacious and illusory call and an offer of salvation that's not actually genuine to quite a few of the people who are hearing it. You have uh, you know, God shamming, basically, in their case. So that's not what we're talking about when we're talking about a direct call or a, about this distinction between indirect and direct. Um, anytime you hear the word of God, that is the direct call. And if somebody is not converted, that's not something that you say, well, they must have gotten a different call. The call is the same. Okay, so now we come to illumination. Illumination, the distinction they made was pedagogic and spiritual. Pedagogic is external, enlightens the sinner's intellect. Spiritual is internal and enlightens the sinner's will. Now, this is a, this is a distinction similar to what we had under the last heading. Uh, the pedagogic, you can understand that without any particular supernatural principle being invoked. Now, they did say that the, super, that the pedagogic call, like the spiritual call, was the work of God. You know, this, this is the spirit teaching. The spirit is teaching. But he's teaching in such a way that anybody who understands grammar and is willing, basically, you know, to put the time into figuring it out will be able to understand and will be able to learn the Christian faith in a notional way, in an intellectual way. Um, but he will not be persuaded by it. He will not say, oh, that's a good idea. Oh, that's amazing. I believe that. It won't resonate with him. Um, and of course, uh, we, we've all met people or seen people or read people uh, who actually do have a pretty good understanding of the dogmas of the Christian faith, but they just don't believe them. You know, and they might, in fact, think that they're appalling and terrible. So that's the distinction between the pedagogic illumination and spiritual illumination. Now, the spiritual illumination, you don't just recognize that God is sovereign and that and that what he says goes, and that his law must be obeyed, but you actually want to obey his law. And you say, well, that's, a, that's how things should be. Why would I want to do anything else other than what God says? If you just have the uh, pedagogic but not the spiritual, you might instead um, you know, call God a tyrant and rail against the idea of religion and be Christopher Hitchens. So uh, Heinrich Schmid, who's a 19th century figure, but he's summarizing the later dogmaticians on this point. And as in the order of nature, external precedes internal knowledge, so here the Holy Spirit produces an external, which is preparatory to the internal knowledge, and then produces the internal. But as man attains the one as well as the other kind of knowledge, only upon proper conduct on his part, in reference to the grace ministered to him, the operation of the Holy Spirit, if the will of man do not proceed further, may also be restricted to the first. 
or the operations of the spirit may be restricted to the intellect and not extend to the will of man as they should. And here we start to see the problem that arises in uh, Lutheran scholasticism regarding the ordo salutis. Um, this is, uh, it really departs from, uh, from scripture and from the Lutheran confessions and definitely from the doctrine of Luther on this question of conversion and the question of election. It departs in a way that's completely parallel. And uh, this summary you get after the fact, and Schmid buys into this too. Schmid, Schmid uh, was, not, was not better than his sources on this point. Um, you end up with a kind of synergism, which flows you know, from the idea, which is, which is perfectly uh, Lutheran and has a good Lutheran and scriptural pedigree, that there's no, there's no distinction on the, side, on the part of uh, the Holy Spirit who calls between the two different kinds of call. Um, and if a man rejects the gospel, it's because he rejected the gospel on his own, on his own volition of his own will, out of the hardness of his heart. Um, so in, but in the development of this in the 17th century, you get, especially toward the end of the 17th century, this dividing line between the pedagogic and the spiritual. It's like the pedagogic, sure, anybody can get that. And of course, you've got to remember, this is happening in the context of a Germany where the state church is Lutheran. Um, in most of the states of Germany, each one has its own, um, but most of, the states, most of the state churches are Lutheran, and everybody there is assumed to be Lutheran, and everybody's baptized as an infant. Um, but in your actual experience of people, they're not all actually discernibly Christian. You know, in the things that they do, sometimes even in the things they believe, although you are not going to find, you know, a, a whole lot of rank unbelief um, in that century. And so uh, they have to distinguish, you know, when somebody is growing up and they're being taught the Christian faith, this person learned his catechism well. You know, he's, he, he got the pedagogic illumination, but he doesn't particularly seem like he wants to be a Christian. He doesn't seem to care about what he learned. And so you get this distinction but, um, where somebody can learn all of pedagogic stuff, but if his will does not cooperate, if he doesn't take it seriously, if he doesn't meditate on the word, et cetera, we'll see some quotations further on, then he's not going to get the second half of it. And without the second half of it, he's not going to get to this stage either. So here's David Hollis, who's um, the last big figure in this age, as we learned last night, and also the worst on this point. The most gracious God seriously designs to illuminate all men, but only they are actually illuminated, who called and led to the church, receive the grace of the Holy Spirit, and listen attentively to the divine word, read it, and meditate upon it. The grace of the Holy Spirit is not irresistible. For the sinner, if obstinately perverse, may hinder the supernatural illumination of the Holy Spirit by opposing a veil or malicious obstacle. But the sinner not obstinately opposing is efficaciously enlightened by the Holy Spirit through the word of God. So I think, you know, they, they told themselves that this wasn't synergism because the man was still being passive. The man was still being passive. Um, the uh, one who's saved isn't doing anything. He's just not resisting with a hyphen. Not resisting is what he's doing. And so it's totally passive. And they figure as long as they make that as passive as possible, they don't have synergism anymore. But really, they do. Um, and, and you see it when they start talking about the positive side of this. Listen attentively to the divine word, read it, and meditate upon it. Okay, those are active things. Those aren't passive things. Those are things that you can do in the first half in order to dispose you know, yourself to go along with the spirit and get the second half, too. Ordinary illumination is not accomplished instantaneously, but by intervals, by degrees, by acts frequently repeated, that man may be disposed and prepared to admit continuously more and more light of the truth so that if he should repel the first degree of illumination, the Holy Spirit may deny him the next, for it cannot occur without the first. So we get the same idea that we had in the last quotation, um, along with the idea that illumination is this, uh, you know, it's a long process. And anytime you've got a process, anytime one of these things is made into a process, you've got all kinds of points along the way where the human being seems to be cooperating with it or not cooperating with it, and you say, well, that's... That's why it worked or why it didn't work. All right, we'll come back to that problem because we'll see it again in, in this locus. Uh, conversion and regeneration is the third part of conversion. And here we're on good grounds dividing it into contrition and faith. It's right in the Apology of the Augsburg Confession. Repentance consists 
of two parts, contrition and faith. Now, it says repentance, um, but repentance is a very closely related idea to conversion and regeneration. Um, conversion in the, uh, let's see, they say there's a transitive and an intransitive sense of this. The transitive sense is when God converts you, and the intransitive sense is the man converts. And we use the word both ways. So the man converts is the man repents, and so repentance is the same thing. And uh, contrition and faith. So that's just basically good law gospel stuff there, right? Leonard Hutter or Hooter, I think, who's uh, one of the earlier scholastics and it seems to be better on this point. The only question here in dispute is what can an unbelieving man, hitherto unregenerate, do by his own strength in his original conversion? To which we reply that man can do absolutely nothing, not even the very least thing, towards beginning or effecting his conversion. And that the beginning, the process, and in short, the whole development of his conversion is to be ascribed altogether and alone to the operation of the Holy Spirit. So this is a good, solid, confessional Lutheran statement uh, by this early scholastic. Um, and of course, somebody could still insert the synergism here, but as things developed, the synergism got inserted here too, as things developed later on. David Hollis, conversion can, also, can conversion also be viewed as a process, not just illumination, but can conversion also be viewed that way? He said, as regeneration is conditioned, by the conduct of man in regard to the influence exerted upon him. It will take place at once or gradually as man's resistance is greater or less. The former takes place with children in whom there is no other resistance than that which dwells in every natural man, which however is overcome by the Holy Ghost operating in baptism. The latter occurs with all adults in the case of whom resistance only gradually disappears. On God's part, all the energies which are needed to enable man to believe and lead a spiritual life are readily and altogether sufficiently offered to him, but this grace is not compulsory, therefore not irresistible, for its acceptance depends on the free will of man. An interesting thing you can see in this quotation, uh, though I didn't pursue it, I had enough, I had enough to deal with, um, this distinction he makes, you know, children get this very easily operating through baptism, but then he says the latter occurs with all adults all adults, including the ones who are baptized as children. So you got it very easily. You were converted very easily in baptism as a child, but you still have to be converted again. Um, you still have to be converted again. You have to be converted continuously. And recon reconversion, um, which is, you know, reconversion is, is an orthodox Lutheran teaching and not just in the technical sense of they taught it in the 17th century. It's a good confessional, but you have to fall away first. Right, who fall away from the gospel, and then you're reconverted. This seems to be assuming that everybody falls away, um, which I'd like to follow up, but we're not going to do that here. Uh, so here you have the idea that this also is a process, and in fact, a process that's going to be very hard to distinguish from illumination. You, you ran these two processes together, and uh, the only landmark is the final result of conversion. Well, where does one end and the other begin? And in fact, you see in David Halla's um, that he puts regeneration before conversion in a way that the others don't. He puts regeneration, is that the way it was? Regen yeah, regeneration before conversion. And he calls regeneration specifically the regeneration of the will. And there basically it becomes the same thing as spiritual illumination. So those two things really do blend together in him. So Schmidt in the 19th century summarizes the later dogmaticians, or Hollas at least, Conversion, then, is to be called a work of God so far as this change cannot at all be produced without the agency of divine grace. So far, however, as this change cannot occur without an internal movement in man which is conditioned by his own will, conversion, in another point of view, can be regarded as proceeding from man. And boy, that's synergism. That is, that, that is straight out synergism there. And David Hollitz and... Uh, maybe to a lesser degree in his contemporaries, and Schmidt is not critical of this when he, when, he produces this, when he produces this summary here. But let's go back to the source here. Let's go back to uh, the main architect of the formula of Concord, Martin Chemnitz, 16th century. Conversion or renovation is not a change that is accomplished and perfected always in a single moment in all its parts, but it has its beginnings and its advances through which in great weakness it is perfected. So wait, he's talking about conversion as a process too. What's going on? When prevenient grace, that is the first beginnings of faith and conversion, are given to men, at once there begins the struggle of the flesh and the spirit 
and it is manifest that this struggle cannot occur without the movement of our will. Thus, at first, the desire is very obscure, the ascent very languid, the obedience very feeble, and these gifts should increase. They increase in us, however, not as a block of wood is carried along by a violent impulse or as the lilies grow without having to labor or care, but by effort, struggling, seeking, praying, knocking, and this, not of ourselves, it is the gift of God. And that bit at the end right there, this, not of ourselves, it is the gift of God, that is the important thing to point out here because it's not in the part that Schmid quotes from this, from this locus in Chemnitz, but if you go to the locus and read it, um, in all of the things he doesn't quote also, it's very clear that Chemnitz is talking, he, he means to be understood exactly as St. Augustine is understood here. And he quote, has a great big long quote from the Confessions of St. Augustine in here also. Yeah, what he's saying is, yeah, I mean, we, you can't deny that in some people's experience, in many people's experience, conversion is a process. You know, they, they hear the gospel, and, and, and they're not immediately converted at the first time, but they continue to hear it, they continue to run into it, they continue to, uh, you know, Christians are introduced into their life, they read the Bible periodically, thoughts are introduced into their heads, and suddenly, one day, it, it all makes sense, and they have that aha moment, and they have that regeneration, and they are converted. Um, and he's saying, yeah, the will of man is engaged in this because man's not a rock. Man's not a rock. You can manipulate a rock and, and it just sort of flies around under the forces of physics. Um, but if uh, the Holy Spirit is working in a man, you're going to see it in the man, what the man wants to do, what the man wills, what the man purposefully does. But he is very clear when he talks about this, he is very clear that this is all to be attributed to the grace of God working in the man. And you ask, why did the man believe? Why did the man um, pray, knock, struggle, seek, etc. And it's all, it's the grace of God working in him. It is the grace of God monergistically doing this. This is just what it looks like when God's saving a man. And so it's not the same thing. Um, so I wanted to point that out in case there's anybody out there saying, well, conversion does kind of seem like a process. Yeah, it is. It is a process in how we experience it. The question is, when you're talking order salutis, you're talking about the supernatural work of God and not how it appears in, in our experience. You're talking about the supernatural act of God that's happening below the surface that, that explains why it happens. And are you introducing the will of man into that question? Or are you introducing the will of God into that question only as the will, the will of God is what, is what saves, is what converts? So Chemnitz and, you know... Um, the 16th century in general, Martin Luther for sure, had that emphasis. Here's Hollis again. Illumination has respect more to the intellect, regeneration more to the will. So that's how you see the connection between regeneration and spiritual illumination in his ordo. The former consists formally in knowledge concerning sacred things from the divine word. The latter consists formally in the gift of faith, which is specifically identified with conversion. So he's really blending the two together here. The effect of the former is a knowledge of the divine mysteries. The effect of the latter is confidence in the merits of Christ. The former precedes, the latter follows. Sanctification, taken in a narrower sense, differs from illumination. One, in regard to the particular subject, because by illumination the intellect, proximately and formally, and by sanctification the will is made perfect. Two, in regard to the extent, because more men are illuminated than sanctified. In regard to the particular three, in regard to the peculiar effect and design, because the effect of illumination is gnosis or knowledge, the supernatural knowledge of God and divine things, but the effect of sanctification is holiness and righteousness. So now we see that because it's a process and because man is participating in this process, you can get stalled out partway through this process, not only in the middle of illumination between the pedagogical and the spiritual, but even after justification, you can get stalled out between justification and sanctification. You can be illumined, you can be converted, but never actually sanctified. Um, and this is, uh, yeah, never actually sanctified. Not like you were being sanctified and then you fell away and lost the faith, but this is just, you just didn't get far enough ever. All right, here's a modern, I didn't put his dates because he's actually still living, Carl Broughton. He is a, uh, I think he's in the NALC now. Uh, he was an ALC theologian and uh, was in the ELCA for a while. 
But he has some interesting criticisms of the age of orthodoxy on this point. Justification, he's saying they define justification really well. It's an act of God non-dependent upon a subjective change for the better in order to exclude anxious questionings of a troubled conscience over the righteousness of works. Yet in the systems of doctrine, its belated position makes justification wait upon a whole series of inner acts and changes, such as vocatio, that's calling, illuminatio, conversio, and regeneratio. Hence, what was gained by a radically objective definition of justification is virtually lost by the position given to justification. So he's saying justification, it appears kind of late in the ordo salutis. And um, you have all this other stuff happening first in which synergism can get in and on which justification depends. And it really means that justification ends up experientially, at least, not being the center of the Christian gospel anymore. It's not the center of the Christian proclamation because really it's the end that you're trying to get to by all this preparation. And in this, the 17th century systems made justification depend upon the new life, namely upon regeneration, although their actual definition of justification as a forensic judicial act of God should have prevented them from doing this. Rather than precede, justification follows the all decisive events described by conversion and regeneration. Justification of the unbelieving sinner is transmuted into justification of the believing sinner. Now, this is a criticism that I'm not as sympathetic with on Broughton's part um, because I, I think he means it to be a criticism of the whole idea of ordo salutis. You know, that, that if you've got all these things before justification, then justification can't be the center of the Christian faith anymore. And if you, in any sense, put regeneration before justification or make justification dependent on a faith that receives the gospel, as the Lutheran confessions clearly do and as the Bible does, then then he says you don't have justification at the center anymore because um, it's the justification of somebody who's already been regenerated. It's like, oh, how, why do you need justification? You've already been regenerated. Um, but if you understand this as happening as, as, the, as the act of God, and now here we get the distinction between logical precedence and temporal precedence. If it's the act of God, if God does one thing, you know, he flips the switch, the light goes on, you're illumined, you're converted, you're justified. You know, we can, we can set up this logical order, but it actually all happened all at once. And you don't have any possibility for, uh, you don't have any possibility actually for justification getting shunted down the road and becoming a, a door prize. <laughs> oh, you're, you're already regenerated. Guess what? Your sins are forgiven too. Bonus. Uh, that doesn't actually happen in that, if you understand it correctly. But the way it gets developed in the 17th century, where you've got this long period of illumination, and then conversion becomes a long period too, and the will of man at every point has to, coordinate, has to actively coordinate with the Holy Spirit, or else you're not going to get there, it actually kind of does. Now, Broughton, it was a pretty good chapter. His uh, solution that he proposes in the next chapter is to pay attention to Paul Tillich and the dialectical theologians. So that's, <laughs> uh, he kind of analyzes the problem pretty well, but the solution is really bad. Um, the solution is actually in our, in our tradition and, and in the Bible. I'll get to that in a moment. I want to point out one other thing here that Broughton helped me see in his article there. Um, the traditional definition of faith Notitia, ascensus, and fiducia. Knowledge of the gospel, assent to it, and trust in it, or in Jesus Christ through it. Um, this is uh, something that normally we, we treat of as something, you have faith, what is it? So we talk about the three parts of faith. But when you, uh, when you overlay this over the extended period of illumination um, in the or age of orthodoxy, um, and on this in, in this particular locus, I should probably say the so-called age of orthodoxy, um, you have uh, knowledge and assent specifically associated with the pedagogic illumination. Because somebody can hear and learn theology and can say, yeah, I believe that's true, but never actually come to the point where he cares. Never actually come to the point where his uh, existential questions and problems and concerns uh, lead him to faith in Christ. Never actually feel any sort of pangs of conscience or worry about his relationship. Never actually get to the trust part. That's the spiritual illumination. And so you can have two-thirds of faith. You know, almost there, you can have two-thirds of faith. And you can even get the two-thirds of faith more or less by yourself. Um, 
or at least a lot of help, you know, you, you can help God out quite a bit on that one. But then the fiducia, if you don't do a good enough job cooperating with the first two, you don't get the, the capstone. So here's the result of this, quenched it. These three parts of faith are expressed by John 10, 12, or 10 to 12, where the verse, speaks of no, verse 10 speaks of knowledge, verse 11 of assent, verse 12 of confidence. Uh, to believe God signifies to believe that God exists. To believe in God signifies to believe that those things which he speaks are true. To believe on God or upon God signifies by believing to love him, by believing to go to him, by believing to cling to him and be incorporated into his members. Heretics can have the first, right? Heretics can believe that there is a God. The orthodox, only the orthodox can have the second, that is, to believe in God and that what he speaks is true. The third, the regenerate. So you can be an orthodox Christian believer and not be regenerate. Okay? You can be an orthodox Christian believer and not be regenerate. What does that do to your confidence of salvation? Do I, do I trust in Christ for my salvation? I believe that he saves me. I think that's great. Do I trust in him? Like, have I become regenerate? The former two pertain to the, intel, or the, former two pertain to the intellect, the third to the will. The first and second have respect to the entire word of God, the third to the promise of grace and the merit of Christ. How can anyone tell when he's crossed over from death into life? How can anyone tell when he's become regenerate? According to this kind of theology, how can anybody tell that I mean, basically, I, I believe the gospel. <laughs> I hear the gospel. I know that Jesus saves me. That, of course, makes me happy. You know, I had the experience when law and gospel are presented to me. But if, I was, uh, if this system was hardwired into me, I could say, well, that could all just be assent. That could all just be knowledge and assent. Do I really have fiducia? Do I really have trust? What is trust? I don't really want to give all the credit to Pieper here because I'm sure there were people before Pieper who started making this criticism. I, and, you know, I know there were, Walter was one of them. Um, but uh, Pieper is the dogmatic that we, uh, that we have right now, and so I wanted to, uh, to show how this has changed, right? The, the, the chief dogmatic of the Synodical Conference, and so that's the Missouri Synod, the Wisconsin Synod, the Evangelical Lutheran Synod, and uh, I guess the AALC was never part of the Synodical Conference, but your theology is, is the same. Um, so uh, in recent years, it has become fashionable to speak of men who believe in Christ but are not justified and regenerated. And conversely, of regenerated men who are not yet converted, of men who are awakened but have not yet turned to God through their self-determination and self-decision, of men who are members of Christ's body but have lost faith in Christ, such a chaos will keep terrified souls from knowing whether they are under wrath or under grace and will confirm the secure in their carnal security. It is therefore of the utmost importance to know that regeneration, awakening or vivification, illumination, calling, and repentance are synonyms of conversion, describing the same act from different viewpoints. And here's where I'm, I guess I'm going to differ a little bit from Pastor Cooper um, last night because... Uh, he saw this as sort of like a step back from the order of Salutis and um, as, as something that he was uh, critical of in Pieper, um, that Pieper's lumping all these things together as, as if they're one, especially with regard to the call. Um, but I see it, and I'll talk a little bit directly to that point in a moment, I see it as like the easiest systematic cure, the simplest way to cure what ailed orthodoxy on this point. Calling is illumination, is conversion, as far as God is concerned. Uh, this is one action of the Holy Spirit. Remember, one supernatural action of the Holy Spirit. Um, he calls, which is the same thing as to say he illumines. The calling is a vocal, um, auditory metaphor. The illumination is a visual metaphor. He sends out a sound wave. He sends out a light beam. Um, and has this effect upon you of conversion. And then we get these other ones in here, awakening equals vivification equals repentance equals conversion all the way around, all this nice equation all the way around the, the block, and we get a black box. A black box. You can't look into this box and figure out the inner workings of it. 
It's a black box. The word flows in and faith flows out. And it's an amazing machine. And we don't know what happens in there, but God does. <laughs> also known as the kindling of faith in the gospel. How do you get from somebody who's, uh, you know, rejecting the word of God, who is mistrusts and hates God and loves himself to somebody who says, yes, that's me, I am condemned, but you know, thanks be to God, I'm saved. You go through this. God does this. And we, and, and we can describe it from all these different sides, but we can't actually um, claim any sort of credit along the way for it. This cuts out synergism completely. So, black box on conversion. Okay, election can be divided into foreknowledge and predestination. And uh, this makes sense if you know Romans 8. This is, uh, this is Scripture's order salutis, okay? This is the closest thing we have in Scripture to, well, I guess we have other passages that work pretty well, but this is the most obvious. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those whom he predestined, he also called and those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. So we've got five points of our ordo right there in those three verses. Foreknowledge and predestination. So we get the problem. The, the problem in the age of orthodoxy that corresponds to synergism in illumination is election intuitu fidei finalis. That is, in view of final faith. And this is, you know, you may never have heard this from a Lutheran before, although there are Lutherans you can hear it from still. Um, so you probably identify this as the Arminian position, um, Arminian uh, versus Calvinist position. Predestination presupposes prognosis, the foreknowledge of certain persons believing to the end. It formally denotes the ordination to eternal life of those men who, according to the divine foreknowledge, receive and continue to employ the means of grace. And this is from Hollis. Everyone who will perseveringly believe in Christ to the end of life will certainly be saved and therefore shall be elected and be written in the book of life. Do you see that causation? The one who perseveres shall be elected and written in the book of life. But Abraham, Peter, Paul, etc., will perseveringly believe in Christ to the end of life. Therefore, Abraham, Peter, Paul, etc., will certainly be saved and therefore shall be elected. The causation uh, election is like, why is election even in this system? <laughs> why is election even in this system? God chose something to happen because it was going to happen anyway. And that's, you know, and that's synergism. That's, that's the old Arminian dodge, pure and simple, being taught by one of the kings of Lutheran Orthodox theology. Quenched it. Faith enters into election. This is quenched it trying to defend and explain how it's not synergistic. Faith enters into election not by reason of any meritorious worth, but with respect to its correlate, or so far as it is the only means of apprehending the merit of Christ. Or in other words, faith is not a meritorious cause of election, but only a prerequisite condition, or a part of the entire order divinely appointed in election. He's saying the merit is all Christ. It just so happens that you can't have that merit unless you grab it by faith. Um, so that's why faith being for and foreknown is uh, the basis of election. Um, this is okay, he says, as long as you don't claim uh, any merit from your faith. But okay, say I can do that, <laughs> you know. First, first, how can I do that? This guy doesn't believe, I do believe. Well, it's better to believe the word of God than not to believe the word of God. Sin makes you not believe the word of God. So I must be better than that guy who doesn't believe the word of God. The only way you can disabuse me of that is if you say, no, you believe because God granted you faith in a way that was completely outside of your control and he hasn't had that experience for some reason. You know, and then you can take away my pride and then you can take away my, the, the contribution of my will, but how else are you gonna do it? And then if you do manage to do it and say there's no merit involved here whatsoever, it's just purely coincidental, well then what is it? If it's not my merit or God's grace, what is it? It's random chance, that's the only thing it can be. You know, it's like, uh, boy, I'm, I'm glad this, this thing, this inexplicable thing called faith happened to me. You know, I, I can't even attribute, I, I can't even uh, explain it divinely. But boy, I got lucky. But the formula of Concord, from which they were deviating, says, the eternal election of God not only foresees and foreknows the salvation of the elect, but is also from the gracious will and pleasure of God in Christ, in G Christ Jesus, a cause which procures 
works, helps, and promotes our salvation and, which, and what pertains thereto. And upon this divine predestination, our salvation is so founded that the gates of hell cannot prevail against it. And as many as were ordained to eternal life believed. That's one of those scripture verses that really makes Arminians, uh, it gives them hives there. Now, Jesus preaches, and why do people receive? Well, they were ordained to eternal life. And the uh, intuitive Videi theologians say, well, no, they were ordained to eternal life because they believed, right? Well, no, that's not what the gospel says. Um, it is a cause. Election is a cause. And then you can say, well, it's a cause, right? It's a contributing cause, along with the will of man, right? No, it's not. Because upon this divine predestination, our salvation is so founded that the gates of hell cannot prevail against it. If it were an insufficient cause, if it needed other causes to gather with it and do the heavy lifting, you would not be able to say from this one cause, our salvation is so founded that nothing can happen to it. It is the cause, or it is a sufficient cause at least, without getting too scholastic about it. Later, Lutheran theologians sought to foist this doctrine on scripture in place of the doctrine of Luther and the formula of Concord. Because wittingly or unwittingly, they wanted to find an explanation satisfactory to human reason why with God's grace universal and natural depravity alike in all men, still not all are converted and saved. In other words, why election is not universal. But the intuitu fidei finalis theory fails to solve this mystery as long as one adheres to the divine monergism of scripture in man's conversion and preservation of faith or holds that faith in solidum is the work of the Holy Ghost. Only with a synergistic basis will this theory furnish the explanation sought. If you're not a synergist, intuitu fidei doesn't explain anything. Cut it off. It's not doing anything. <laughs> it's not doing anything but confusing people. So is this Calvinism? Predestination to eternal life is not absolute, Quenstedt says, but is founded upon Christ as mediator, the antithesis of the Calvinists, who exclude the merit of Christ from the causes of election and refer to means of accomplishing it furnished in time and therefore deny that Christ is the meritorious cause of our election. Okay, this is uh, a distinction that, that is true, that, that Pieper also maintains. Um, between Calvinism and Lutheranism, that in Calvinism you have the, the very first thing that God does is without consideration of anything except his own mysterious will, he elects a few. And then he says, okay, how am I going to carry out this election? This is what I'm going to do. I'm going to send my son and the, uh, all this, uh, the whole plan of salvation there uh, serves predestination, which happens first. Um, and so Quenstedt is saying, and uh, it's a point that the formula of Concord makes also, um, that... Predestination is not like that. Predestination, everything is predestined um, at the same time. Not to, the, the later thing is not later um, put in order in order to serve the election, but rather the election is that the gospel will go on all the world, the world, the gospel of my son Jesus Christ whom I will send, and those who believe shall be saved, and he is going to believe, and he's going to believe, and he's going to believe, not through his own merit, but because I am saving him. And the, the difference here, well, here, let's quote the formula. Nor is this eternal election or ordination of God to eternal life to be considered in God as a secret inscrutable counsel, in, oh, in God's secret inscrutable counsel in such a bare manner as though it comprised nothing further or as though nothing more belonged to it. And nothing more were to be considered in it than that God foresaw who and how many were to be saved, who and how many were to be damned. This one shall remain steadfast in faith. That one shall not remain steadfast. The formula is saying that the whole thing, basically this, this creates like a crisis of faith in, in Calvinism because you can always say, well, okay, I believe and I've done all this stuff and as far as I can tell, God is working in my life, but am I actually elect? Don't know. I don't know if I am elect. I just have to work under the presumption that I am elect because otherwise I will go insane. Um, <laughs> In, in Lutheranism, it's not just the presumption that you're elect. It's if all this stuff is happening to me, that's it's God's God is electing me. And this is why sometimes, um, you know, uh, Lutherans talk. And, I, you know, in, in Paulson's case, I don't know what he is saying about election for sure. Um, but when he says the preacher elects, you know, that was something you mentioned last night in your presentation. Um, that sounds, it sounds crazy, but if, if you understand it as sort of what the, for, the formulas point, that what happens in time is the same thing as God's election. You know, they, they, they are the same thing. It's just one's eternity and one is time. Then when the preacher speaks the gospel, he, that is actually God working election through what he says.
But he, Paul said specifically contrasts those two things. He says it's yeah. not God's eternal election. Right. And, and, that, and that's the problem right there. That, that's the problem right there. And yeah, I mean, it's, it's like uh, trying to cut one side off of a coin <laughs> there. Uh, but this is, this is an epistemological thing. Um, how do you know you're saved? How do you know you're elect? Well, I believe the gospel. <laughs> uh, apparently, I'm elect. And yeah, some people fall away, and some people stop believing the gospel, but I believe the gospel. You know, you can, you can bring that up to me if I stop believing the gospel. <laughs> If a person asks, am I chosen to salvation, he should, turn, he should in turn be asked, do you sincerely believe in the gospel? For if the elect have been chosen through the sanctification of the spirit and belief of the truth, 2 Thessalonians 2.13. He makes much of this in his dogmatics. You're not just chosen, you're chosen through the sanctification of the spirit and the belief in the truth. And in Ephesians 1, you're chosen in Christ. If the questioner continues, if I have been chosen from eternity to the salvation, I shall inevitably be saved. If I have not been chosen, I shall be lost, no matter whether I now hear the gospel and believe or not. He should be told there is no such absolute election to salvation at all. That God does not seize his elect by the ears or the neck, but took hold of them in eternity, and this Greek is the same thing as up here, through the sanctification of the spirit and belief of the truth, by means, oh yeah, in the same way as he lays hold of them here in time. So, you know, this, uh, I can just sit here and do whatever. I don't have to, have to, I don't have to actually believe. And, you know, if, you know, if I'm not elect, then believing would be pointless. Um, that is a kind of election that doesn't exist. The only kind of election that exists is the kind through the gospel, through the experience of the gospel. And that's why the Formula of Concord, Article 11, says, you want to see the, you want to see the book of life? You can't see the book of life. The book of life is in heaven. It's in God's mind. Oh, wait, you can see the book of life. The book of life is Christ. If you're in Christ, you're in the book of life. This is the most Lutheran concern of all. The theory that God has elected ex privisa fide finale, that is, from the foresight of final faith, was hatched in the mind of an impractical bookworm and thrives in library dust. How's that for a quote? No theologian and no Christian has ever been able to put this theory to practical use. We grant that some of the old intuitu fidei theologians teach that Christians should and can be certain of their eternal election. However, they reach this conclusion because forsaking their theory in practice, they direct Christians not to the foreknowledge of God, but to the divine promises pledging preservation in faith. And good Calvinists do the same thing. But it's, you know, it's inconsistent with, their, with the state of theology under the other locus. The distinction we made when discussing the call is relevant here too. If there was such a thing as an insincere call, right? If there was such a thing as getting a general call without a special call, we would not be able to put full faith in the gospel because maybe it's not for me. If there was such a thing as limited atonement, we would not be able to put full faith in the gospel because it's, it's only for the elect. And I don't know if I'm elect. So uh, he's saying, you know, finally, I mean, this, this is a, that's contrary to confessions and it's contrary to scripture, so it's got to go for that reason but it's also got to go for this very practical Lutheran soteriological concern of how do you have faith? How do you have faith in the gospel? If even God's election is based on the fact that you had faith in the gospel. You're, you know, you're making me be the start of this. That's not a firm foundation. So foreknowledge, Pieper ends up saying basically foreknowledge equals predestination, and this is Calvinists say this too. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. Um, he answers the argument um, that you get from Hooter, who was actually, you remember, he was one of the good early scholastics on the earlier point, but he distinguishes between foreknow and predestined by saying, well, foreknow, it can't, be, it can't mean basically the same thing as predestined. It's got to be foreknew something about them, like foreknew their faith, foreknew their faith pres, pres, you know, persevering, something like that. It can't just be he knew them in advance, like, oh, like, you, like you know a friend. Oh, I know that guy. God knew that guy in advance and predestined him to be conformed. He says, you can't have foreknow mean the same thing as predestined. It's got to be foreknew something about him on the basis of which he predestines. Because otherwise, you say, those whom he predestined, he also predestined. And that's the argument you get from Hooter. That's the argument you got from a lot of other people. Pieper points out, it's not whom he predestined, he also predestined. It's whom he predestined, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. That is, the ones he knew in advance, the ones, the ones he chose in advance 
He chose to be conformed to the image of his son. He didn't just elect them. He elected them to a specific end, to a specific and that's glorification, which is going to be my topic tomorrow, the, the full confirmation to the image of, of the Son, in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. So election also is a black box. And that makes sense because it corresponds, election, in, election in, corresponds to conversion. Election is eternity, conversion is time, the word goes in, faith comes out. Um, I'm not suggesting that election is another synonym for conversion, like the other things, um, but it is the eternal version of conversion, and it's just as mysterious. Uh, the, will, the will of God does something in there, and uh, if we try to figure it out, the only way we can is by inserting ourselves into the process. If one holds that conversion and salvation do not depend solely on God's grace, but also on man's self-conditioning, free choice, correct conduct, lesser guilt in comparison with other men, etc., one will also teach that God from eternity elected individuals to salvation, not purely by grace for Christ's sake, but in view of something in man. So final, the question comes up, the crux theologian, theologorum, the cross of the theologians, the question the theologians desperately want to answer and can't and therefore suffer pain. Why some and not others? We have one answer from Siegbert Becker, who was a Lutheran scholar earlier in the 20th century, uh, wrote uh, The Foolishness of God about Martin Luther's uh, treatment of reason in theology. And his statement on this, all men are totally depraved, and there's no difference in man. God is equally gracious to all, and there's no difference in God's will, yet A is lost and B is saved. And there is no conceivable reason why this should be so. That, that's, his, that's his solution. I read this book in college uh, when I was basically a Baptist years before I became a Lutheran. And I, you know, I wrote in the margin, there has to be some other answer to that. There has to be, you know, that's not acceptable. And you know what? I still think that. I still think that that's a bad answer. Um, to say there's no reason at all, we do have a reason. Scripture directs us to hold our tongue. The question should remain unanswered. Scripture speaks of God's unsearchable judgments in ways past finding out in his guidance of individuals and nations. And the scriptural reason for the incomprehensibility and inscrutability of these judgments and ways is the fact that no one has first given something to God for which God should recompense him. Pieper says it's unanswered, but look, he does it in a different way. He says what is, what is unanswered is God's judgments. God's judgments are unsearchable. He doesn't say, well, God didn't do it, and man didn't do it, but it happened. I'm at a loss. There's no one else who can do anything. You know, this is like Quenstead trying to say uh, faith does it, but it's not meritorious. Um, there, there's no third term. There's no middle term. There's no, like, chance that can step in. Um, God doesn't roll dice. And uh, he says the question is unanswered, but the question that is unanswered is why not all are saved? Why not all are elect? It does come back to the judgments and ways of God. It comes, it comes to, the, to the hidden will of God. Um, and, we can't, and that's why we can't answer it. You, you don't say, God didn't do that. <laughs> you say, I don't know why God did that. That is the, the part that's unanswerable. Remember, the formula of Concord calls election a cause. And so uh, the call goes out. What happens in the call is the same thing. Uh, God's grace is not irresistible in principle. Saving grace is resisted every time someone hears the gospel and doesn't believe. But the elect are defined as those whom God chose from the, before the foundations of the world to be saved. And all the elect will be saved. And election is a cause of salvation. So there is at least one irresistible grace um, in, in the Bible and in, and in the Lutheran confessions. Um, and that's election. And we probably don't have any time for questions. But that's a shame. Okay, so uh, you challenged me on this issue of the distinction between the, the call and, and conversion. Mm -hmm. And uh, I just want to, I'll just give my thoughts and, and you can give your thoughts. Um, I, I, I agree with you in, in terms of the problems that you find in, uh, in Hallaz and some of the later dogmaticians. Uh, and I think that that is what develops in pietism, is you end up dividing them into a number of steps and hoops you have to jump through or something like that. Uh -huh. um, but, but what I find is there's a lot of American Lutheran theologians like uh, uh, Adolf Heineke and uh, Revere Franklin Widener would be 
um, the two primary examples of, of those who are willing to keep those distinctions but get rid of the synergism at the same time. Now, my, let me just point out my, my concern here with conflating the call with conversion, and that's my issue here. Not The other, are, I believe, are synonyms of a conversion. Um, but if the call is a synonym of conversion, that means the call is only for those who are actually converted. And I think when, and you're, this would get to the same concern that you had, is if we're looking at our election, where do I find my election? If the call is universal, I can have a trust in the call as it is given whenever God's word is preached. But if the call is only that which actually converts, in some sense, I'm pointed back to myself to know whether I have the call or not, to see if I'm truly converted. Um, that would be my concern with where Peeper goes in uh, conflating the two. So just give your thoughts. Well, if the, call, if the call goes to all, if the call is the same thing, like there's, there's one act, God does one thing, and like the blind man and the elephant, we describe it in different ways based on its effects in us and, and, and our experience, um, then uh, I, think, I think it's okay because the, we know the call is not always accepted. We know the call is rejected, that people reject the call all the time. But then the call is not a synonym of conversion because the call is universal. Conversion applies only to those who are actually converted. Well, to reject the call is to reject conversion. Um, you know, the, 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 call, the call draws you and conversion is being drawn. And if you, if you uh, dig in your heels and you don't allow yourself to be drawn, then you're not converted. Um, Walther claims that there are only three times in history prior to Missouri um, that the proper iteration of conversion and election happened. So scripture, the formula of Concord, and then the Council of Orange. Council of Orange. <laughs> Would you agree with that? Do you think that that's right? Or do you think that there are, um, do you think people described it well, but maybe used faulty terminology? Or do you think that there's any other place in history where that was correctly proclaimed? Uh, I think you could say those, those are the times when it was most clearly um, formulated. Those were the times it was most clearly formulated um, in a doctrinal statement. A lot of the writings of St. Augustine, I mean, the Council of Orange was very Augustinian, although it happened after Augustine's death. A lot of the writings of Augustine, you get this. Um, you know, he's very good on predestination for the most part. Uh, and he had influence all throughout, you know, all throughout the... Uh, so maybe if you want to talk like 100%, 100% correct explication of this without other things getting in, then... He might, he might be right about that. Uh, but there's very high percentages in other, t in other people in other times. I, I especially appreciated your, your first black box with, uh, with all the equal signs, um, and not just because it looked neat. Um, but I guess a question I would have is, um, and, and you did address this partly already, a lot of these things relate to our experience. Like we, 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 we perhaps according to both just the differences in, in human temperaments, you know, some being more intellectual, some being more emotional, having these, you know, different experiences. And we don't want to be ruled by experience, but we want to acknowledge the realm of, of experience and, well, otherwise put, the existential, how we do encounter God's word. How would we, you know, split, <laughs> rightly divide that so that we don't denigrate the fact that we do want to seek after illumination and we do want to seek after true piety and love of God and we do want to do these things and we don't want to deny that there is a real full experience of the human person and intellect and will and emotion, all these things, but that those, you know, these, these habituations to, you know, virtue and, and, and to, you know, piety are not you know, st hoops we need to jump through, uh, but are still good. I mean, you can't do nothing. You have to do something. Right. And that whole, you know, well, I, I don't want to be, I don't want to be a, a Pharisee, so I don't want to, you know, move. Well, that was Kenneth's point about how we're not rocks. You know, if you're being converted, if God is working on you, the evidence of that will be shown in, in your will and the things you choose to do. Just like if you're picking up a rock, the evidence in that will be shown by the rock levitating, <laughs> you know? Um, so, you know, you don't worry about, you don't worry about the monergism. You just, you just go ahead and do, um, 
what you want to do under the gospel and under the law, moved by the gospel and the law, and be the person that you're meant to be. And, you know, and you can live at those times, you can live quite a bit of the time as if you were, you know, a synergist. Um, but th- what the doctrine of election and conversion properly understood is, is it's the undergirding the grace of God, um, that when you think about it, you say, you know, yeah, I, I believed, um, you know, I, I did all these things. You tell, you give your, you give your testimony, and it involves a lot of things that you did and things that you thought and things that you discovered. And you know, even when you say, I believe, you are the subject of that sentence. You recite the creed on Sunday. With the yeah. Foundation. Yeah. Faith. Be centered. <clears throat> yeah. Faith is something you do. So faith is a work. You know, faith is a work. Um, and the, so the formula, uh, so the apology has to say faith doesn't say because it's such a good work, but because it takes hold of the merits of Christ. Um, but it's, it's something you do, but it's not a meritorious work. It's something God creates in you. And that is what you realize in your moments of reflection, that I can't take credit for this. By grace, I am saved through faith, and even that, not of myself. And, and, and faith is active not only in works of love and charity, but even in, in worship, even in, in going forth in the real incarnate, you know, going to receive the sacraments. I mean, that could even be spoken of as a work of faith that is not meritorious, but it's just something that faith and its sort of economy does in order to live. Right. As does in its living, you know, in its acting, in its being. Yeah, and, and whenever you're tempted to take uh, credit or to take um, pride in your record of church attendance or whatever, uh, you remember there before the grace of God go I, and, you know, God called me and God moves me and I can't take any credit for this. Um, but, you know, when you wake up on Sunday morning, you don't have to think that. Uh, talking about illumination um, and the spiritual aspect of converting the will, um, illuminating the will, rather. Um, You mentioned how some of the scholastics kind of blended regeneration and the illumination of the will. Um, And I had always thought of regeneration as the changing of the will. So that's confusing to me. Um, Well, that's that's why they get blended. (laughs) So is it proper to blend them, or should they be separated in some sense? The way I understand it, uh, is even in the scholastic order of Salutis, um, the, re- the, the illumination, the spiritual illumination is the process and regeneration is the result. Like God illumines you spiritually and once that's done, you believe and that's conversion. The, the, the completion of illumination is conversion. All right, thank you.